Hi, I'm Mike Sikorsky. I'm the CTO and VP of Engineering for Unit 42. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about how threat actors continue to leverage commercially available malware. First, a little background on myself. Uh, on Unit 42, I lead both the product and the engineering teams where we're driving uh, threat intelligence, consulting services, uh, managed threat hunting, managed detection and response, and then how everything we do in, in Unit 42 flows into all of our Greater Palo Alto Networks products. Uh, some of my background, uh, I was out of college. I was five years at the NSA. Uh, and then I went on to work for Mandiant, where I was there for 15 years, helped unravel the APT1 and uh, wrote that report during the New York Times investigation, all the way up through FireEye and the divestiture. And also, uh, most recently there, helped with SolarWinds, uh, the discovery of it, tearing it apart, uh, and socializing that across the government and the industry. Uh, and I'll actually be touching on uh, SolarWinds a little bit later today. Uh, I also teach at Columbia University uh, using my book, Practical Mauer Analysis. And uh, I have two kids and I also do triathlons. And I'm based in New York City. Uh, so what are we here to talk about today? We're here to talk about how there's freely and commercially available offensive software out there today. And this is a whole industry debate. Uh, of when is it a pen testing tool and when is it malware? To me, I'm a malware guy, so I always say it's always malware if it could be if if software can be leveraged for evil purposes. So that's the way I feel. But when does a pen testing tool become malware? Is it when the threat actors start using that tool? Is it when the person who wrote it starts selling it to them? Is it when they start embedding into their pen testing tool, happy hacking and enabling ransomware actors to be more successful? So all good questions. And then there's a very large industry debate about these tools and their availability in the market. What are the positives and negatives to them being out there? Well, the positives are red teams are more enabled. They can conduct better attacks against you for testing purposes and improve your security or uh, they can just up the bar for security in general because it it sort of creates a bar of like, you better at least protect against the commercially available malware, right? Well, we'll see. That's not always the case. And um, the negatives are it lowers the bar for the threat actor. They don't, they no longer have to develop malware. They could just buy it for a cheap price. And it also makes attribution really hard. If all the attackers are using the same malware, then it's really hard to tell who's who and which, ha which hacker is actually inside your environment. And the question I have for you is, what do you think? Uh, in my informal polling, it seems like everybody's caught in the middle. There's some strong emotions that these are cyber wep weapons and some emotions that um, we need to get these out there to, as much as possible to keep pushing defense teams. Uh, but most of the time, it's a gray area of like, how do you restrict these? But what I know is we need to really up our game in the security industry to make sure that we're protecting against these. Because guess what? Threat actors are using them. They are being successful in using commercially available software. Uh, Cobalt Strike is the most popular example of that. Uh, for example, what you see on the screen here is actually the first lines of code when we were reverse engineering SolarWinds, where we realized that there was a supply chain backdoor inserted into a digitally signed binary being shipped by SolarWinds down to their customers inside an update package. Super sophisticated capability. What is the first thing that Solar that the Russia did during the attack? They pivoted off that really fancy supply chain backdoor and started using Cobalt Strike, commercially available malware. Guess what? Blends in, people already have this running around their network. And so Russia just kind of tagged along with that as they infected thousands of networks worldwide. And how often are we seeing Cobalt Strike? Even today, like two years later, we look in our open source telemetry, we're saying 16,600 samples per month. We're seeing 1,200 samples in our products uh, per month. And this is a recent. We do on Unit 42, we do about 1,000 IR engagements a year. Took a look at you know how often are we seeing it there? 7% of our IR engagements, we see Cobalt Strike being used by the threat actor. Why are the threat actors using this? It's to blend in. It's to make attribution harder, 
right? And it, it's really easy for them to acquire this software as, as we'll see. So what we're here to talk about today is the new kid on the block, Brute Rattel. Is this going to be the new Cobalt Strike? And the, the answer is, I could already tell you it is, because <laughs> that's how, how often we're now seeing it uh, being used by threat actors around the world. And so it is, it is the new one, and it is the one that everybody needs to be aware of. So in May of this year, Unit 42 discovered this. Uh, we're constantly hunting through all of our data access, some of it's open source, some third parties, all of our telemetry off the firewalls and endpoints, uh, sharing with the government, so on and so forth. Uh, what we saw uploaded to VirusTotal was something that matched uh, APT patterns and techniques, okay? And when that happens, we take a look at it and say, is this a, something new from you know, one of the big attack groups that we track and follow? So right away, we tear it apart, and that led us to figure out that this was actually Brute Retail C4. Uh, and we published a blog on that uh, with a threat advisory, included signatures for the community to protect themselves. Uh, and the goal is to get the word out there as soon as possible. So let's talk about what Brute Retail is a little bit first. So C4, you might have heard C2 before, so they try to be fancy, and it's a custom customized command and control center. That's the C4 for red team and adversary simulation. So the capabilities of this are pretty robust. It can uh, speak multiple protocols over the network, do custom C2 channels in the chat rooms that you're in. If you're using Microsoft Teams or Slack in your environment, it can use that. Uh, they also have analyzed and do uh, EDR and, and antivirus uh, evasions built into the software. Normal capabilities, things like file upload, file download, uh, and then a lot of obfuscations that make this a lot harder to detect and a lot harder to reverse engineer than most malware. And it is on a release cadence, right? You see there, there's new releases constantly coming out as this evolves. And so we have to track it and stay on top of it and make sure that we have protections against it. And like I said, this is commercially available. They have a website, Dark Vortex, uh, and someone named Chaitin, uh, based in India, is who created this. Former red teamer for both CrowdStrike and Mandiant decided to quit their J job and focus entirely on writing malware for sale. Oh, sorry, I mean pen testing tools uh, for sale. Uh, and you wonder, well, how successful is this business? Well, back in May, before our blog released, you could follow this individual on Twitter, was bragging about having 500 licenses already available. And you say, well, how much does this cost? Well, you go to the website, $2,500 per license. So already doing over a million dollars of revenue. And we think that that's likely doubled or even tripled uh, since May. And how does that compare to Cobalt Strike? Well, Cobalt Strike is like over $10,000 per year. So you know the bar here is a lot lower for somebody to purchase it. And then you say, well, how do you vet? If you're selling this, you shouldn't just sell to anybody, right? Well, if you look on the website, it says, well, yes, we do vet individuals. It needs to uh, be a, have a ver verified via having a LinkedIn page. So I, I, it's safe to say that a nation state could afford uh, $2,500 for a license and could probably uh, create a shell company and uh, a LinkedIn page uh, to, to get to acquire this. And this is also available on the dark web for just a little bit more money. And I'll talk about uh, in a moment here how the licensing has actually been cracked and now it's just available everywhere. So even that price point is almost no longer even relevant anymore. And this is a cat and mouse game. Uh, it's a little bit more in the open. Sometimes we, we reverse engineer the attacker's malware, figure out how it all works, and then we have sort of a back and forth with them. And it's sometimes you know all offline. Some of this is actually happening on the web, on Twitter with this individual where they're you know, a little frustrated that we put out a blog with detections and, uh, and so there's been some back and forth there. Uh, and if you also take a look digging through their website a little bit more, uh, you could realize that they're really spending a lot of time to make sure that they circumvent security products. So here we see that it says reverse engineering top tier uh, EDR and antivirus products was done before the release of this. And if we dig into the malware itself, we see things like happy hacking, and we see this code, which I, I don't expect you to dig into, but maybe you see a little string in there that says wallpaper. 
uh, which means there's a capability in here to actually change out wallpaper. And you know what changes wallpaper? Red teamers don't normally do that, but you know who does? Ransomware threat actors, because they post the ransom note as the wallpaper in the background, and that enables them to get the ransom. So that's a capability that's embedded into this, even though it's meant for just pen testing, right? So interesting to, to see it like that. So quickly diving into Brute Retail, like how, how does this work? What does it look like? Well, the way it's made up is there's a commander, okay? And that is sort of like central command where everything happens in the middle. And you can create listeners, which are just listening posts that you can post anywhere. And they're going to listen on a port, be waiting for an incoming connection. And, and then they also talk back to the commander. And the commander is able to generate new payloads to deploy with the malware called badgers. And if you don't know what a rattle is, it's actually a honey badger. And so he calls them badgers. Uh, so that's where the name comes from. But it's just a name for the payloads. Uh, and we've seen payloads for x64, x86 architectures, and also PowerShell and Windows. Uh, and the commander can generate those uh, payloads unique to the to who they're attacking, deploy them, and then they'll come back and talk to the listeners, and the lister, listeners will talk to the command center, and then they can tr control all of their payloads worldwide. Just to give you a quick taste of what this looks like, uh, the listeners can be launched anywhere with the simple command, command line, password, uh, certificates, so on and so forth, and then the commander is able to uh, log in and get access to those. So this robust interface enables you to, to generate the payloads, the badgers, right? And so you have the capability to do x86, x64, uh, PowerShell, whether you want it for shell code, DLLs, executables, whatever, whatever your need and deployment scenario is for this malware, you're able to generate it and get it out the door. This just shows you how robust and how much effort they put into it. One thing I wanted to do next was give you a little taste of how much effort they put into obfuscation and making this hard to reverse engineer. So I wanted to give you a sense of how much effort they put into obfuscation into this malware. Just real quick, take a look. Uh, this is what it looks like as a reverse engineer when we're digging through the code. So this is obfuscated shell code that's being built on the stack. And this is done to the tune of 20,000 instances of this. It just looks like gibberish, but you have to actually put it all back together, de-obfuscate it to, act, to get access to the original backdoor that's a payload that is run on a system. This is actually something we could signature because there's a consistent pattern to it, even if that data changes based on the payload that they're generating. And after all 20,000 of the, that building of that shell code, uh, they're able to allocate memory, write it uh, into memory, and then actually decrypt it and launch it. At that point, the back door is fully running, but you see it's, it's very hard to, to read the actual code because it's not there. It's all in obfuscated shell code. And we've spent time unraveling that in automated fashions just because we're seeing this a lot and we think we're going to see it a lot more. So we're able to take that uh, and automatically decrypt all the strings, uses RC4. Uh, and then what we see here is a base64 string, which when we unravel that, we're able to see the full configuration of the payload, in which case we could see what IP address, what port it goes to, the user agent string, and get the full configuration out. And so we recreated automated capabilities that could just take a brute retail play payload, rip out the configuration, and we're good to go. So we know who's attack being attacked, what are the IP addresses to worry about, so on and so forth. So how did we discover this? So I talked all about Retail, but I didn't talk about how we found it. So I mentioned we found it on VirusTotal. And when we first found it, there were zero detections on VirusTotal. So no vendor was saying that this was bad. It was packaged up as an ISO file. Uh, and and when we you, you open up that ISO file, ISO is just sort of like, you can think of it as like a zip format uh, where they're able to extract, take a look what's inside. And it looks like a resume, but it's actually not a, a Word document resume. It's a link file, which lures the user to open it up. And when they open it up, 
really bad things happen. There's actually a bunch of hidden files that are dropped, which I've exposed at the bottom of the screen here, which you can see that there's one drive update, which is actually just a binary file that just looks like data. That's gonna be that encrypted encoded payload that I was talking about earlier. And then there's things like one, uh, OneDrive update.exe and version DLL. Version DLL is actually their malicious uh, version DLL, which it, uh, takes advantage of DLL high, DLL load order hijacking to actually get the payload executed and off and running. Real quick, I wanna walk you through what this looks like from the execution chain. So first we have that link file, it looks like a Word document, someone opens it up. What happens is command XE is executed and that actually launches the OneDrive updater that came with, with the malware. Now, that's actually a legit digitally signed Microsoft binary. Uh, so most computers are gonna let it run because it's digitally signed by Microsoft, it's on most systems, it's allowed to run. However, due to DLL load order hijacking, the malicious version DLL that was deployed with this malware is loaded into the OneDrive updater, which means a malicious DLL is now loaded inside of a legit Microsoft binary. What happens next is that version DLL takes that encrypted payload, decrypts it, launches a legit, another legit Windows program called Runtime Broker XE, and injects the code uh, into that and kicks off a thread. And at that point, the Badger payload is off and running. So how did we find this? I mentioned we found this through, through hunting. Uh, well, it looked a lot similar to a cloaked Ursa APT29 sample. Uh, and if you look at how many green check boxes there are, that gives you a sense. Both, both the APT29 sample and the one that we discovered both abuse digi uh, trusted Microsoft digitally signed applications. They both have hidden files. They're both .iso extensions. They both do link files as lures with fake icons to trick the user. And they both leverage a version DLL, named version DLL, same name, literally. And so that execution flow is nearly identical. And so we're constantly hunting through all of our telemetry and all our open source intelligence to find new things. And this hit, we reversed it, realized it was Brute Rattel, and that's how everything kind of transpired from there. Now, this is being used a lot. And once we find it in this one way, that's like our initial discovery. But the next step we do is we tear it apart, reverse engineer it, figure out how it all works, and then say, how can we find this at scale, right? Wildfire alone at, at, at here is capturing something like 30 million samples a day. So we have a lot of data that we could sift through and say, where else are we seeing this? How much more are we seeing it? And guess what? We could look for it on the network and we could look for it in the binary files themselves. And that's what the example of here is that the Brute Retail C4 listener is actually using uh, a cert from Microsoft. Now it's self-signed, it's not real. And you can even see Microsoft's not in California, right? Microsoft's uh, in Washington. So there's, there's a delta there. And we've seen this hosted in, in the top cloud providers. So this is being hosted all over the place. Uh, and what we could do is we could then look on the network for, for these certificates being used. And then when you say, well, how about on the host? Well, we unraveled that payload, the OneDrive update, right? Figured out what it looked like, got the actual original Badger payload. And then we could then hunt for that at scale. And we started to run into it thousands of times globally. And from there, we could then do our automated uh, capability to be able to extract how it communicates out. And then we could identify all of the listeners that are out there. And using that in conjunction with the Cortex Expanse NetFlow upstream data, we could figure out who's actually getting attacked. And so we could figure out that, oh, one of these listeners is in Ukraine, or we could even use it to identify victims, such as in Argentina, North and South America, uh, television providers there, uh, textile manufacturers in Mexico, so on and some, so forth. Now, remember, Brutal is also used by red teams. So sometimes when we're doing victim notifications here, they're saying, oh yeah, that's the red team I have here, I think. And other times they're saying, 
Well, actually, I don't even know what this is and why it's in my environment. So, you know, it really depends what's happening there because you don't know if it's a red team or a threat actor that's leveraging this, right? The key takeaway there is that we take the things that we're learning and then go back and hunt for the more, learn, go back and hunt more, and then just keep growing our capability and defense against it. Because the more brute retell payloads we have, the better our defenses are going to be. Because then we understand all the different versions of it, all the different variants of it, so on and so forth. So what do we do to protect and, and mitigate against this? Well, like I mentioned, we put our blog out there. We, when we put these types of blogs out as Unit 42, we release atoms. What those are are sticks bundles of signatures to be able to download. And regardless of what your product or capability is, it offers you some sort of protection. And so our goal there is to make sure we socialize as fast as possible with the greater industry so that everyone can protect themselves as quick as possible. Of course, as we're doing this, we're working with the product teams across the board. Uh, for threat prevention in the firewall, making sure we're covered on the network there. For Cortex XDR on the endpoint, making sure we have protections there and we're blocking that activity, both from a signature-based capability, but also uh, based on how it's behaving, making sure we're catching those injections, everything else, and testing it thoroughly to make sure it works. And then, of course, in wildfire, make sure it's being caught in, in our sandbox technologies. So post-publication, how has this gone? As I mentioned earlier, it turns into a cat and mouse game. Uh, this is much more of a public one where uh, Dark Vortex, the creator of Brute Retail, is putting out there, oh, I read the Palo Alto Unit 42 blog, and I've already modified it, and none of their signatures and atoms work against it. So, ha. And it's been that sort of back and forth. Whereas, who knows, maybe some of the spotlight and additional sales could have been uh, maybe, maybe a less back and forth. I don't know. Uh, another thing I wanted to highlight is that the industry coverage uh, for something this big, right? We're seeing threat actors around the world use it, uh, and it's really important to have coverage. So we put this out, put out our blog. At that time, there was zero vendors and virus total detecting it. And after three weeks, that number only went up to 29 out of 60. So, and I don't know if you're, you're, you know, but some products, the way they work is they submit a piece of a file to virus total. And if it's not above 50%, then it says it's good. So in this case, three weeks in, some products are still saying that this is a, a, a good file and not malware. That's a big problem. I actually just checked today and it's only up to 36 out of 60. So now, now we're a few months later and it's still, we're still not, a, it should be 100% detection, right? So we're still lacking this, this great coverage across all products worldwide. Uh, and this is you know, just, a, just a, something we gotta think about as a community how to fix and get the word out even better than we already did. And we continue to have interactions uh, with Chayton. Uh, so uh, some of it's positive, less than positive, where it, uh, specifically tweeting out that I reverse engineered the Cortex -E XDR product and I, I'm confident that I worked against it. So, and, but at the same time, we're testing it in our lab and we're confident we protect against it. So it's this backing forth game. Also, Unit 42, we have an awesome red team. We have an awesome security team at Palo Alto that also does red teaming. So we have, we have lots of red team capabilities. This is something we should probably want to buy, right? So we actually reached out and said, we have $2,500. Can you please sell this to us? And our, our uh, request was declined uh, and said, oh, I'm not selling licenses to any antivirus or EDR companies at all. Um, so we tried our best to acquire it uh, and uh, got denied. More recent developments is we're seeing this in incident response investigations this week. So we're seeing this uh, Brute Retail leveraged, sometimes in combination with Cobalt Strike, where Cobalt Strike will be on one port and uh, for, for a listener, and Brute Retail on another port, both at the same time attacking the same network. So interesting that, is it the new kid on the block? Well, yes, it definitely is. It's being deployed side by side with Cobalt Strike. After that, they're deploying the Black Cat ransomware uh, malware family uh, and lots of anti-EDR utilities discovered in that deployment. So they're leveraging these commercially available malware, deploying ransomware because of the ease that those things provide to do so. And then we're coming in and doing the investigation. And, and so this is really, 
prevalent, right? Threat actors are using it to deploy ransomware. This is a problem we got to get in front of and make sure we're protected. And once this has been out there long enough, it gets cracked. So the licensing, it's software, it has a license. That license got cracked. It was put on, on the dark web and everywhere else. And so now anybody could just download a version of it. Uh, of course, uh, Dark Vortex wants to keep making money, so has created new versions and put out detections to help. Uh, and, and the tweet on the right here, you see uh, uh, where they're actually pointing the finger at another vendor who commercially sells malware. So apparently Dark Vortex sold malware to them and is saying they're the ones that have put it out there. So there's, there's not just infighting with the security companies here uh, for, uh, between uh, Dark Vortex and the security companies, but there's also some infighting there on developers and, and companies putting out who put out commercially available malware. And sometimes they're trying to do the right thing. So realize that this was cracked and put out there. Uh, and is so is claiming that, hey, I'm, I'm going to release signatures to help uh, protect, to protect against this. Uh, and that way, the next version I, I release, which won't be covered by the signatures, is going to be even better. And again, this is something where we have to just stay completely on top of this, like we do with Cobalt Strike for now into the future, because Cobalt Strike's been around for years and years. And I think Brute Retail is going to be the same thing. We're going to have to fight against this for years to come. And how this all looks is uh, inside of Unit 42 is we have tremendous access to data. So millions of firewalls, millions of endpoints with XDR, access to the telemetry coming back, third party, open source intelligence, sharing with uh, agencies around the world, bring, uh, and then our services, right? We're doing MDR, incident response, digital forensics, learning about what the attacker is doing right this second in the front lines, bringing that all together into our knowledge store, aggregating that at telemetry, and then curating it, analyzing it, and trying our best to continually find new things that then feed back out into everything you see. So in other words, we find something in our product telemetry, we then make sure our products are protected, but then we make sure our, our managed threat hunting team and our IR team is also looking for it and vice, vice versa. So we're really trying to share and flow across as efficiently as we possibly can. In conclusion, what does this look like? You know, threat actors are going to use commercially available malware. So we need to defend against them and we need to stay up to date on every single version and modification that's coming out of those tools. The community putting out this blog was the right thing to do because we got to get the word out and get everybody protecting themselves for, from this. And we're going to have back and forth with Dark Vortex into the future. That's the way this game is. We're very accustomed to the cat and mouse game with attackers. Sometimes don't really like it going on in Twitter, but you know that's sometimes makes it a little bit more fun. And one thing I ask is, you know, what are your security vendors doing to protect you from commercially available malware? Right? Are they actually protecting you from them. Uh, and I think that another thing to think about is if you're doing red teaming, why not have your red teams use Cobalt Strike and Brutal? That would be great, right? That's what threat actors are doing it. So why not have the red teams do it and see if you're actually good at detecting it? Uh, and so you know, those are the, some of the paths I see this, this going into the future. If you want to learn more about Unit 42 and the thousand incident responses we've done in the last year, we've actually put out an awesome report that is both looking at the data sets and the things we see uh, in the past year, and then also looking forward uh, as to where incident response is gonna go, what types of attacks we're gonna see. And then we also provide recommendations on what people can do uh, based on what we're seeing people not do and getting called in to actually do an incident response. So feel free to download the report and read through it. I think there's a lot of interesting data points in there. And with that, I thanks for your time and uh, good luck, happy hunting and take care. <music>